I want to begin with a little bit of a, an anecdote that kind of will lead me to talking uh, about the book and to give you a sense of uh, where the idea came from. I, I was um, in graduate school at Yale, it was my second year, and I was taking a class with a visiting professor from UC Santa Barbara who was a specialist in long 18th century in British art, and the course was at the British Art Center at Yale, which is a really amazing building and center that has probably the best collection of British, British art outside of the United States. And in this class, which was on material culture, we were asked to do what was called an object lesson, to talk about um, a work of art, a painting, or um, something made of pewter or silver, um, an object from the collection uh, from, the, from the 18th century, and to present it to the class. In addition to learning about British art from the 18th century and also what was called a culture of consumption, a period during which many people in England um, were very interested in not only um, purchasing objects, um, but also th they were also very interested in um, and learning how to craft and perfect their craft, whether it, it was painting or sculpture or, um, or even working in metal. And um, one of the issues that I had in the class is that I found it difficult to have conversations with my colleagues sometimes about the fact that during this very same period where this, there, were, there was an, an enthusiastic culture of consumption, it was also the same period of the transatlantic slave trade, and in particular in the UK, a time period where in certain cities like Liverpool, London, and Bristol, the, the slave trade was really at its peak, at least in the last half of the 18th century. And so for my presentation, for the object lesson, I chose to do um, an object lesson using ephemeral objects, maps, and city directories that showed how the city of Liverpool grew from a very small town in 1650 uh, to a large city by 1850 over a 200-year period, and a city that had the most sophisticated dock system in the world um, by the end of the 18th century. And this was due in part, actually primarily due in part to their involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. And doing this presentation, I came across, at least in city directories, the names of infamous slave traders whose names were actually not just in the directories, but they were also on all the streets, not all the streets, but many of the streets in Liverpool. Um, and I pointed these out in my presentation, but I also came across this image that I call the slave ship icon, which is the subject of my book. And I'll just show you um, an example of what I'm talking about here. So it's an image that you're probably all familiar with now. And so I came across this image. It's something that I saw probably in high school or growing up. Um, it's something that I thought about because when I was growing up in Silver Spring, Maryland in the 70s and 80s, in our textbooks and classrooms, whether it was a history class or a social studies class, there was very little written about the history of slavery or the slave trade. But sometimes there will be images such as this one to illustrate that history, sort of as a just a one note uh, kind of footnote in, in a book. Fast forward after I gave that presentation, I think that was in about 1997 or 1998, the following year, I wrote a paper that won the Sylvia Arden Boone Prize, um, which was a prize established at Yale, named after the first African-American woman to earn tenure at the university, um, who happened to be also um, an art historian specializing in Africa and African-America. Following that, um, that piece was published in the Chicago Art Journal, and it became clear that this was going to become my dissertation. It became my dissertation in 2002. I finished, and I came to Cornell in 2003, uh, beginning in Africana studies as a visitor, and then uh, finding my home in the History of Art Department the following year. Um, I owe a really big debt of gratitude to Mary Pat Brady, who's sitting here um, in the second row, who in 2005, I think it was, introduced me to Hannah Monarski, who was the art editor for Princeton University Press. And she was visiting campus this one day, and she said, well, you know, you should go see Cheryl, and Cheryl, you should go see Hannah. So we got together, and I presented my project to her, and it has now become this book. And it's, it's taken a long time. It's had a long journey, and, and there are, you know, many reasons why projects take as long as they do. Um, I know that when I originally signed the contract with Princeton, which was I think around sometime in 2006, the hope was to have the book out by 2007, 
which was <laughs> just the next year. I know that's like a big leap uh, to get a whole book done, but it was also the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade, which was marked by a number of celebrations um, in the UK. Uh, it was a time when um, the, the Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, which is a fund that um, uh, collects monies uh, through the lottery, uh, but gives them often to um, arts and culture, um, amassed the largest amount of money ever given to artists to focus on um, a project and a celebration that related to African and African diaspora history, and that was the 2007 uh, bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade. And I want to kind of begin in the, be in the introduction um, just to give you a sense of how the project is shaped. And then uh, depending on uh, how much patience you have and how much time we have, I could read from the first chapter and introduce one of the characters in the, um, in the book. And I, I should tell you that it's, um, it's a book that has uh, 11 chapters. Uh, it's divided into three sections. Um, and the sections are based, uh, for the most part, chronologically, but there are also certain thematics that kind of uh, help to, to um, hold those sections together. Um, it's a book that is uh, in the history of art um, in terms of its, its, its methodology, uh, but it's also extremely interdisciplinary. The department that I was in uh, at Yale, actually I was in two departments. I was in history of art and African American studies, and the African American studies program was an interdisciplinary PhD. So that, that, that's part of just the way my head is wired in the way that I think so that there are um, images that I discuss, there are uh, paintings, there are prints, there are quilts, there are um, films and uh, plays and installations of exhibitions and so on and so forth. So that's quite a lot and also poetry at the very end. But I'm going to begin here in the, in the introduction. So I begin with a selection of works from the 2007 Bicentenary that use description of a slave ship to start a conversation about the practice of mnemonic aesthetics and its crucial relationship to what I call the slave ship icon, the most enduring image from the history of transatlantic slavery. In this book, I trace a visual genealogy of the slave ship icon in the minds, memories, and creative work of black artists and their allies in the 20th century and today. Throughout history, poets, painters, orators, and later photographers, installation artists, performance artists, and sound artists have employed mnemonic strategies that contribute to a sustained and recognizable practice of remembrance in African diaspora visual culture. Without a doubt, the slave ship stands as the most prominent visual metaphor for the historical memory of the Middle Passage. As Paul Gilroy writes, and I quote, the image of the slave ship a living microcultural, micropolitical system in motion is especially important for historical and theoretical reasons, serving as a lens through which we may focus attention on the Middle Passage and on the various projects for redemptive return to an African homeland, on the circulation of ideas and activists, as well as the movement of key cultural and political artifacts. The image I call the slave ship icon began as the official British abolitionist plan of the slave ship Brooks, a schematic representation of the crowded lower deck of the slave ship's human cargo hold. When it was first created in England in 1788, the striking schematic engraving, description of a slave ship, exposed the underbelly of a commercial vessel bearing human cargo, depicting the means of transporting enslaved Africans to the Americas via the Middle Passage one of the formative experiences of the African diaspora. In studying this image, we find that it has had at least two lives. The British abolitionists who created it used it as a political print, a visual weapon, in their fight to end the transatlantic slave trade. The artists, engravers, and printers who modified and distributed it were white men working primarily in Europe and North America. The political and propagandistic activity surrounding the slave ship icon was particularly dynamic in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, up until the abolition of both the slave trade and slavery itself. What followed was a period of dormancy, perhaps of apparent death. Then, beginning with the New Negro Arts Movement, also known as the Harlem Renaissance, the slave ship icon underwent a process of rebirth. In this second life, the slave ship icon was, and continues to be, reappropriated, 
symbolically repossessed by the descendants of those who were the subject of the image by diasporic Africans, that is, by black Atlantic artists and their allies. It has since come to have a special place in the souls of those black folk who descend from that forced migration, and it has proven to be one of the most powerful images of the last 230 years. And it's also set to music. No, I'm joking. Okay. Um, in looking for comparable uh, images in Western culture, one must turn to such iconic subjects as the crucifixion. Undoubtedly, the crucifixion offers a compelling parallel, for both images have been repeatedly rendered and reworked over the centuries, but they simultaneously embody death and rebirth. The slave ship icon frequently has been likened to a coffin and to a womb. It is a site of death, of dying Africans, and of new life, of a people who would persevere in the face of slavery and unspeakable cruelty to become a free people who help to define the modern era. Since the beginning of the New Negro Arts Movement, visual artists working in cosmopolitan metropoles around the Black Atlantic Rim, that is, the, co the coasts that circumscribe the passage from Africa to the Americas to Western Europe, they have reimagined the slave ship icon in their works. Artists such as Miguel Covarrubias, Amiri Baraka, Betty Saar, Romare Bearden, Keith Piper, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Godfried Tonkor, Hank Willis Thomas, and Rumald Hazume have taken hold of the slave ship icon in their works of book illustration, painting, theater, performance, installation art, printmaking, photography, and film. These artists have redeployed the slave ship icon as a symbolic marker, making it central to their works as they relate the Middle Passage to their historical origins, as well as to their present moment. Public historians and exhibition designers at museums and memorials alike also have called upon its architectural schematic and as a kind of blueprint for designs of installations that seek to tell the history of transatlantic slavery, colonialism, and empire. The slave ship icon has remained a persistent phenomenon in contemporary culture here in the United States and throughout the Black Atlantic. It appears with remarkable frequency in fashion, film, and digital media, as well as in works of fine art. It has been a favorite t-shirt design that recasts the history of slavery in cataclysmic and unforgiving terms with slogans such as the African Holocaust or never forgive, never forget. Posters protesting the prison industrial complex and the rise of global capitalism have featured the plan of the slave ship as a visual reminder, not only of the way things used to be, but also as a portent of the future. The plan of the slave ship seems to have inexhaustible uses in digital space as well, inching across the open, opening pages of Keith Piper's CD-ROM from the year 2000, relocating the, the remains, and also films by Spike Lee as well. Even as the disaster of Hurricane Katrina unfolded in the late summer of 2005, some political and cultural commentators noted how residents of New Orleans stranded on the Interstate 10 brought to mind images of the slave ship icon. In a live interview with reporter Anderson Cooper of CNN, the Reverend Jesse Jackson remarked, and I quote, today I saw 5,000 African Americans on the I-10 causeway, desperate, perishing, dehydrated, babies crying. It looked like Africans in the hull of a slave ship, end quote. And in a more recent and recurring tragedy at sea, where thousands of African migrants attempt to reach the shores of Europe in makeshift boats, aerial photographs and installations by artists such as Hazume use the slave ship icon to position and or to lend a certain urgency to their depictions. Even illustrated children's books published for the American Girl Doll franchise have shown an early version of the slave ship icon to discuss the life of Felicity, a young girl whose lifetime is set on a plantation during slavery. Dr. David Driscoll, the venerable historian of African American art, owns a gold bracelet designed by Robert Croslin of Hyattsville, Maryland, which he regularly wears. At Swan Galleries in New York, annual auctions of African Americana held since 1998 have sold examples of the slave ship icon taken from abolitionist tracts and books. In the February 2010 auction, three different versions were offered for sale, with estimates ranging from $300 to $2,500. Regardless of its commercialization, this image continues to inflict a psychic in impact 
on the black, brown, and white people who wear it, view it, and in other ways consume it. Despite the evident and ongoing generative power of this image, its visual and cultural history told from the point of view of art history and African American studies has remained largely untold until now. What about the graphic quality of the slave ship icon enables it to continue to have resonance for us today? What has compelled artists and curators to use it as a visual memory aid and a teaching tool? Why is there an urgent need for ordinary people to attempt to embody it, to revisit the terror it represents, to reenact its profound silence and pain? And how has the symbolic possession of the past through the use of the slave ship icon shaped an artistic practice of mnemonic aesthetics among an increasing number of African diaspora artists, architects, and cultural innovators? In this first ever art historical study to illustrate the significance of this image in the Black Atlantic imagination, I have set out to answer these questions. By unpacking the contents of the whole, so to speak, we can begin to understand how the slave ship icon has stood as a template for the historical memory of the Middle Passage for visual artists around the Black Atlantic. And so that's just a little bit from the introduction. And if you're still with me, I'll, I'll read a little bit from it. <laughs> Are you still with me? Yes? OK. Um, this is from the first chapter. It's called um, Idea, Image, and Text. And it's in the first um, section of the book called Sources, Roots from 1788 to 1900. And this is from a, a section uh, called Creating the Slave Ship Icon in Great Britain and the United States in 1788. The first abolitionist engraving of a slave ship titled plan of an African ship's lower deck with Negroes in the proportion of only one to a ton from 1788 was conceived by the Plymouth Committee of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade in England. Viewed from above, the schematic plan shows a cargo hold packed with hundreds of enslaved Africans represented by tiny, uniform, darkly shaded figures, and so hints at the barbar barbarity they were made to suffer during the Middle Passage the transatlantic voyage from Africa to New World slave markets. Among the first to publicly acknowledge the visual impact of this image printed on paper that measured six and three quarters by 16 inches was African-born Olada Equiano, whose letter to the Plymouth Committee appeared in a London newspaper, The Public Advertiser, on February 14, 1789. In his own carefully chosen words, Equiano professed, and I quote, Having seen a plate representing the form in which Negroes are stowed on board the Guinea ships, which you are pleased to send to the Reverend Mr. Clarkson, a worthy friend of mine, I was filled with love and gratitude towards you for your, your humane interference on behalf of my oppressed countrymen. An ex-slave and free man of color living in London, Equiano was an outspoken opponent of the slave trade who regularly described his personal experience of slavery at public gatherings. His public performances had gained Equiano such a reputation that by the time his letter appeared in the public advertiser, he was on the verge of publishing his enormously successful autobiography titled The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olada Equiano or Gustavus Vasa the African in March of 1789. It is not hard to imagine why Equiano immediately recognized the prince's capacity to serve the goals of abolition. For him, it provided a shocking visual reminder of a place and an experience that he, had, he himself had known. Yet still, it must have been difficult for him to conceive of how anyone could render such an image. Indeed, one wonders just exactly what he felt, what he remembered when Thomas Clarkson showed him the oblong engraving of the plan of the slave ship. As rudimentary as it was in its initial rendering, Equiano nevertheless was transfixed by its power perhaps even in a state of utter disbelief at its ability to represent such a sight of terror and violence. In that moment of recognition, the wound from the initial trauma of being torn away from the land and people he knew and forcibly taken to some unknown people and place was slashed anew. One could picture how his eyes might have followed the contours of the darkly shaded figures, counting each one, possibly imagining the face of someone he once knew. 
fine black lines representing the walls that divided groups of figures by age and sex might have caused him to pause and think about which space he had occupied or the people who had lived and died next to him. The combination of rows and rows of black figures separated and surrounded by fine black lines schematically mapped the space of the hold, marking a route to untold terror. The labels boys' room, girls' room, men's room, women's room appeared as signposts indicating the contents stored within. The title above the bullet-shaped schematic plan of an African ship's lower deck with Negroes stowed in the proportion of only one to a ton bluntly and succinctly described the purpose of the drawing while revealing a modern system of calculation, commerce, brutality, and human domination. So haunting in its graphic depiction, the plan of the slave ship must have seemed capable of psychically transporting Equiano back to that foundational moment in the swollen belly of the slave ship when he was born into an African diaspora. As he described in his own autobiography, and I quote, the closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. This produced copious perspiration so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells and brought on a, it, brought, it brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died, thus falling victims to the improvident avarice, as I, as I may call it, of their purchasers. This wretched situation was again aggravated by the galling of the chains now become insupportable, and the filth of the necessary tubs into which children often fell and were almost suffocated. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole scene of horror almost inconceivable." End quote. The scene in which Equiano recounts his chilling memory of psychological terror and physical captivity in the hold of the slave ship is one of the defining moments of his narrative and a passage that since has been recited frequently as an eyewitness account of the Middle Passage. As an eyewitness and a survivor then, Equiano was in a unique position to endorse the plan of the slave ship, the first graphic representation to provide a visual complement to his own unforgettable hell. By lending public support to this image, his letters situated it within a discourse of artistic production, political action, and popular representations of the black body. The fact that Equiano recognized the hundreds of roughly drawn nude black figures lying neatly in the coffin-shaped hold as his, quote, oppressed countrymen, breathed life into their corpse-like representations. Indeed, by calling, calling them his oppressed countrymen, Equiano immediately brought the issue of their humanity to the attention of his readers. Moreover, his reference to worthy friend and prominent London Committee member Thomas Clarkson located Equiano's position within the abolitionist circles and his ability to stand as a spokesman for the movement. The first, this first engraving of a crowded, ship, crowded slave ship interior was not an isolated print. Rather, it served as an illustration for a small, square, four-page pamphlet printed by the Plymouth Committee. Not only was Equiano profoundly affected by the image, he was also deeply moved by the explanatory text of the abolitionist tract as well. And I go on to quote the text of the pamphlet at length in the next part of the chapter. I'm not going to read that because it is quite lengthy. Um, but one of the reasons that I was compelled to write this book is that I had noticed in other scholars' works that have been written, and many people have written about this image. I'm, I'm of course, not the only one. Um, but there was often more of a focus on the image itself as opposed to really reading the image against the, the text that describes it and the text that really gives you a sense of what is trying to be uh, drafted and illustrated and shown in, a, in an architectural, a naval architectural plan that would give one this sense of a, a 3D um, insight into a, a space that, that, that was not known at, at the time. Um, and, and I also wanted to say, just in terms of the other chapters of, of the book, the first section really looks at how the image came into being in the UK and the US, how it circulated around the Atlantic Rim from the late 1780s until the end of the abolition of the slave trade in the UK, which is in 1807, the US, and in 1808. How even beyond that time, the image was still very powerful and needed by abolitionists because the illegal slave trade continued for many, many years, in fact, until the end of the 19th century. 
And so as naval architecture changed and ships became um, uh, able to move more quickly across the Atlantic, so too did the illegal slave trade uh, continue and become somewhat profitable, even more profitable um, than, than could be conceived of. And so naval uh, uh, squadrons that came from the UK and the US would patrol the seas around the west coast of Africa in places where there were people um, suspected of, of, um, of illegally uh, trading in enslaved Africans. And so this image, again, is adapted to these, these new different kinds of naval architecture or even incidences um, that become notable, such as the Amistad incident of 1839. The image kind of comes up again, and abolitionist tracts continue uh, to be published. Mm -hmm.